Coming up on this week's edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. We'll hear what cattle producers think about the value of exports and a possible trade war with China. Plus, we'll bring you an up-close look at the history of raising cattle in Hawaii. Now, from the Denver headquarters of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, it's NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Hello and welcome to NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. I'm Kevin Ochsner. Mother Nature has been dealing a severe blow to farmers and ranchers lately, from horrific wildfires in Oklahoma to blizzards in the Dakotas and the Midwest. We here at Cattlemen and Cattlemen send our thoughts and prayers to all of you dealing with the aftermath of these disasters. The extent farmers and ranchers go to protect their livestock and preserve their livelihood is truly heroic. For more information on how you can support your fellow cattlemen and women, go to ncba.org. As the U.S. and China continue to march towards a trade war, beef producers are among those that may be caught in the crossfire. Recently, President Trump proposed adding billions of dollars in tariffs to Chinese imports as part of a crackdown on what the president characterizes as unfair trade practices. In return, China has announced it will impose tariffs of its own on hundreds of U.S. products, including beef. Here's Russell Nemitz with more from Washington, D.C. on the overall U.S. beef export picture and what this trade dispute could mean for members of the beef industry. Well, in today's U.S. beef cattle industry, no doubt trade has certainly become a very important component. And with us on the program now is Kent Backus, and Kent's the NCBA's International Trade Director, and trade is also back in the headlines here of late. Let's first talk about the ongoing renegotiation right now between the United States, Canada, and Mexico regarding NAFTA. Well, NAFTA has been a, a very good trade agreement for the U.S. beef industry. You know, uh, for the 25 years it's been in place, we have seen our exports grow exponentially to both Canada and Mexico. Mexico has become a great market for a lot of cuts Americans find less desirable, uh, especially tongs and rounds and things like that, that we just can't sell at a premium here, but we can sell at a premium in Mexico. Uh, obviously, we don't want to jeopardize that access. so our you know, our conversation with the administration has, has really focused on protecting what we have. Don't jeopardize that access that's driven a lot of value to our producers. And so uh, we're optimistic that the negotiations will conclude sometime in 2018. There is a push to try to see the negotiations conclude uh, in May. Uh, given the upcoming election in Mexico and the pending elections in both Canada and the midterm elections here in, here in uh, the United States, uh, you know, there's a big push to try to get some conclusion uh, to these negotiations. So we'll see what happens there. You know, anything can happen depending on the news cycle. So we're going to keep monitoring that. But I think so far, you know, ag is going to come out on top. I think that in the end, we'll continue to enjoy those benefits that are driving about $75 per head. Uh, just to trade with NAFTA countries. You know, let's take a look around the globe now. We just mentioned what's happening uh, here in North America regarding trade with Canada and Mexico, but what about in that very important region of the world called the Pacific Rim? Let's start with Korea because there's still a lot of excitement there for U.S. beef. Uh, you're exactly right. Korea is one of our top export markets. It was our second largest export market in 2017. It's a $1 billion export market for us. Uh, that is something that we're enjoying right now, primarily because of the terms of the Korea-U.S. Free Trade Agreement. You know, under that agreement, uh, which was implemented a few years ago, uh, our 40 percent tariff we were facing prior to that agreement is now phasing uh, down to zero. And so that's given us a competitive advantage in a very, very good market. Uh, Korea, again, they buy a lot of products uh, that Americans don't want, a lot of short ribs, a lot of tongues, uh, and they, they pay good money for it. So we have 
been so successful in Korea that we have now surpassed Australia as the number one import source in Korea. That's something we want to hold on to. So there was a push to, to, rene to renegotiate the terms of the Korea trade agreement and uh, fortunately ag was not included in that negotiation. That's something NCBA really pushed is to, to hold on to those terms that give us that advantage. So we're happy to see a, uh, hopefully a successful conclusion here very shortly uh, so that our negotiators can focus on other Asian markets. You know, that's a perfect uh, segue, if you will, into another very important market for U.S. beef, uh, a, a longtime trading partner of U.S. beef, and that's Japan. Where are we at with, with the Japanese these days? Well, Japan is our biggest export market, uh, roughly $2 billion in 2017. Uh, it's, it's been a great market uh, for U.S. beef. Uh, that's our top market for tongues. It's our top market for a lot of cuts. Uh, but uh, really, uh, you know, the biggest... Uh, impediment we face is a 38 and a half percent tariff. We were hopeful that if TPP would pass the Trans-Pacific Partnership, we would see that 38 and a half percent tariff go to 9 percent. But the Trump administration withdrew the United States from TPP and unfortunately the remaining TPP countries move forward without us. So our competitors in Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and Mexico will all enjoy that lower tariff rate, but the United States is still stuck at 38 and a half percent. We've made a lot of gains in the Japanese market, primarily because Australia has been in a severe drought, uh, but also there's a lot of demand for U.S. beef. We need to capitalize on that market demand, but that massive tariff is going to stand in the way, and if we don't do something to address it soon, uh, then we could lose a lot of the ground that we've gained in the last few years. So you know, our big request for the Trump administration is if we're not going to move forward with TPP, then we have to prioritize a bilateral free trade agreement with the Japanese to give us a level playing field or a better deal into that market. And finally, I just wanted to ask about a big potential market, lots of celebration last summer, the reopening of that huge Chinese market to U.S. beef again. All things considered, where are we at with that huge announcement last summer to today? Well, we were very excited last year to see the Trump administration successfully reopen the Chinese market. We've been out of that market for 13 years. Uh, that's a market that represents 1.4 billion consumers, a middle class that's larger than the entire U.S. population, and really a country that just started importing beef at record numbers just a few years ago. There's a lot of unmet demand and a lot of, a lot of potential we have in that market. Unfortunately, we still face some restrictions. You know, we face restrictions on the use of hormones and beta agonists, technologies that are uh, widely used in our industry. They're science-based and very safe, uh, but, but China has laws prohibiting those products. So we're trying to work to, to hopefully ease those restrictions and let us really capitalize on the potential in that market. Uh, but even with uh, the, the access we have now, we were still able to, to sell over $30 million of beef into China in the first six months. Uh, but uh, that's just the tip of the iceberg. We want access to that entire market. We want to have the Chinese consumers be loyal customers uh, because we, we produce a superior product, a great product that is very popular in Asia. And we see a lot of potential and a lot of positive growth uh, for uh, the U.S. beef and Chinese consumers. And that's important here because we need stability. We need growth. We've got a lot of beef that's going to come uh, onto the market here later this year and into next. We need to be able to move it because that is an important value add for our producers. Exports account for about $300 per head. We want to see that number grow, and we want that to be a driving part of our success in the beef industry. And that $300, folks, is some real money. Kent, thanks for being with us again on Cattlemen and Cattlemen. Thank you very much. Again, we've been talking with Kent Backus, the NCBA's International Trade Director. Thanks, Russell, for that report. It's clear that this is an important issue that could have huge consequences for the beef industry. In fact, we asked cattlemen and women from around the country to share their comments about trade and their concerns about a possible trade war. The trade is adding about $300 a head to our, our fat cattle right now. We would hate to lose any or all of that. Um, however, China has, has uh, been cheating us on some other deals it's probably time to bring everything back around and get par again. Now, Wyoming is a, is a large state with a lot of cattle and not enough consumers, and we export beef, and uh, trade is vital to the industry 
and I hope that uh, trade moves forward. Well, particularly, we're on the Pacific Rim in California. It, it really affects not just beef in the, the state of California, but number one ag state, all of our commodities. We have opportunity. California-grown products moving around the world. We're nervous, a little concerned. Um, obviously, we, we, we know NCBA has got a really strong position on trade. We need to reinforce that. Um, you know, we, we've had good, good success with uh, President Trump, the administration, on many issues, but we want to make sure we, we get our voices heard for agriculture on this one. It's critically important to support NCBA's work on trade. Numbers matter on Capitol Hill, and that's why I'm personally asking you to become an NCBA member. By doing so, you'll be adding your voice to the work NCBA does in defending and advocating for our industry in Washington, D.C. It's easy to do. Just call 1-866-233-3872 or visit the website ncba.org. Still ahead on NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen, we'll hear what one member of Congress thinks about some of the big policy issues that could impact the beef industry. Plus, learn about the history of raising cattle in our 50th state, Hawaii. Stay with us. We'll be right back. No matter what job I've got to do, my John Deere 5E tractor can do it all. Whether I'm cutting, moving feed, or building a fence. Using my 5E means my work gets done faster at a price I can afford, and that works for me. Saddle up and make your way to Denver, Colorado for the 2018 Cattle Industry Summer Business Meeting. This is your chance to stay up to date on beef industry trends and policies. Meet with industry leadership and your fellow cattlemen and women. Plus, you'll get insights on hot topics at the issues forums. Mark your calendar for the 2018 Cattle Industry Summer Business Meeting, August 1st to the 4th in Denver. Find out more at ncba.org. From the farm bill to environmental regulation, when we ask producers about the value of NCBA, one of the answers they give is the organization's efforts in Washington on behalf of the cattle industry. Russell Nemitz joins us once again with an update on a wide range of policy issues that could impact U.S. beef producers. Certainly a lot of time and energy has gone into getting a new farm bill ready for America's farmers and ranchers. And for agricultural organizations like the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, they've been working with members of Congress like North Carolina Congressman and House Agriculture Committee member David Rouser on making sure the new farm bill includes something for livestock producers, more specifically cattlemen and cattlewomen. Congressman, thank you for being with us here on Cattlemen to Cattlemen and talk a little bit about some of the highlights for U.S. livestock producers in this new farm bill. Well, first, it's uh, great to be with you. And let me say at the outset, uh, I think that uh, if you have a good agriculture policy in place where you can feed not only the United States of America, but the rest of the world, uh, that's critically, critically important, uh, not only for the American economy, but for national security purposes as well. I feel the same way about energy production. I feel the same way about our infrastructure making sure you can get products from point A to point B in a timely, effective, and efficient manner. Uh, so agriculture, energy, and infrastructure, I think, are really critical. If you have all the bases covered there, you have everything that you need to make America exceptionally prosperous here at home, uh, which enables us to be very, very strong abroad. So that's the big, uh, broad picture uh, that I like to talk about uh, these issues uh, under. Uh, specific to livestock and, and the farm bill, uh, you know, one of the things I've always loved about the livestock uh, producers is uh, typically when a farm bill comes around, they say, keep us as far away from it as possible. We don't want any, anything to do with the government, uh, which as a conservative, I have great appreciation for. Uh, but uh, animal uh, disease uh, protection is, is critically important. Obviously, there's concern about foot and mouth disease. Uh, we have been working hard to establish a uh, foot and mouth disease uh, uh, vaccine bank. Uh, uh, get that authorized with this uh, legislation. And of course, uh, the challenge that you always have, uh, you got to find the money. 
Uh, as one of my colleagues once said, uh, he said a vision uh, without funding is nothing more than a hallucination. And uh, that's, that, that's really, really true. So uh, we have worked hard to get as much money uh, uh, um, put in place uh, for this um, uh, forthcoming uh, vaccine bank. And of course, uh, uh, we got a lot more work to do, uh, but we at least have the uh, camel's nose under the tent. Congressman Rouser, what about making sure the new Farm Bill has a strong conservation title in it as well for livestock producers? Well, conservation is critically important. It's not only uh, important uh, for agriculture and conservation purposes, uh, but it's important, I think, in terms of building public support uh, for, for a Farm Bill. And uh, not everybody appreciates um, all the effort and the challenges that farmers face, uh, but they do appreciate a good, clean environment. And uh, uh, conservation title certainly helps on, on both fronts uh, in that regard. And uh, so we're, you know, trying to improve that title where we can. And uh, I think uh, folks are going to be pretty pleased with it. You know, members of uh, North Carolina's cattle industry just met with you. And one of the other topics brought up here in this meeting with you that is on their radar continues to be the importance of trade, whether it be here in North America with Canada and Mexico or maybe over in the Pacific Rim, another very important region. Yeah, well, trade is critical for agriculture. You know, much of what we produce uh, is shipped abroad. And that's a great thing. Uh, but you've got to have trade agreements that are fair. Uh, a lot of people talk about free trade, but it really needs to be fair trade. And there's a lot of countries out there that, uh, uh, where we can ne negotiate uh, better agreements. I th think this administration, the Trump administration, is, is committed to doing that. And I think they have a great appreciation for agriculture and agriculture's role in the American economy and, and its necessity for our uh, independence and, and security, energy security as well. I also just kind of wanted to wrap things up just asking, what's it mean to have on the ground farmers and ranchers, uh, like I just mentioned, those men and women that were just in here from the great state of North Carolina, meeting with you one-on-one -on -one when given the opportunity so you can hear from them about some of their concerns? Well, it's really important. Uh, every time I meet uh, with farmers and ranchers or, or any constituent for that matter, you always learn something a little new, no matter how much... Uh, uh, you know, may know about a uh, topic, and it certainly helps you to keep your uh, finger on the pulse of what's going on back home. Uh, a lot of these guys here that I met with today I've known for a long, long time. Some of them are my neighbors, in fact, and uh, so it's always good to see them up here in Washington. Well, we appreciate you taking a little bit of time for us today on uh, NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen, sir. Oh, great to be with you. Again, we've had the pleasure of talking with North Carolina Congressman David Rouser. Thanks, Russell. Now, the best way to stay up to date on all the key issues and events from D.C. is by becoming a member of NCBA. You'll receive the members-only Beltway Beef Newsletter, a weekly update straight from Washington that gives valuable insights on the key policy initiatives that can impact your business. To get the Beltway Beef Newsletter and other exclusive member-only benefits, join NCBA by giving us a call at one 866 233-3872 or you can visit the website ncba.org Still to come on Cattlemen to Cattlemen we'll hear what one state cattle association leader thinks about the value of NCBA's efforts in Washington. Don't go away we'll have more right after this. What does it mean to be an American cattleman? It means you have what it takes where it counts on the inside. At Ritchie, we understand that. It's what's on the inside that defines us. We share the same values, ingenuity, commitment, sense of pride. These are the values that built this country. They're the values that built this company. Ritchie, proud to be a partner to the American cattlemen since 1921. If you're connected with the beef cattle business, then you should like the NCBA page on Facebook. The NCBA Facebook page shares photos, news, and valuable information about the beef cattle industry. You can also follow the NCBA Twitter feed at BeefUSA. So stay in touch with NCBA on Facebook and Twitter. Welcome back. Each spring, the NCBA Legislative Conference gives beef producers from states across the country a chance to travel to D.C. and share a local perspective with our nation's policymakers. 
Russell Nemitz talked with one Missouri cattleman who knows firsthand the value of these one-on-one -on -one interactions. Well, each year during the National Cattlemen's Beef Association Spring Legislative Conference, it's a great time for cattlemen and cattlewomen to meet some new friends and, of course, catch up with some old friends along the way. And that's exactly what we're doing on today's segment. We have an old friend of ours, Mike Deering, who's now the Executive Vice President for the Missouri Cattlemen's Association. And of course, Mike, you actually spent a little bit of time right here in Washington, D.C., serving as part of the NC. CBA's communications department. Talk about that experience and what it was like to spend a little bit of time here in the heart of our nation's capital working on important issues for America's beef cattle industry. So my total time in Washington DC was about eight years and the last part of that was for the National Cattlemen's Beef Association and I can tell you with absolute certainty that the staff, the National Cattlemen's staff is working on behalf of cattle producers in every corner, every state in the in the country and making sure that that we push meaningful legislation forward, stop bad ideas and uh, make sure that the regulatory burden is reasonable and it's not bureaucratic and, and go to the extent of putting people out of business. But I heard a quote at the beginning of this conference. Um, they said the future is not inevitable. You must pursue it. And that's what we're doing. And that's why we're here. And that's why it's so important that cattle producers come to Washington, D.C., that they come to their state capital and they make sure that their voice is heard. Um, lobbyists can only do so much. It really takes that grassroots activation. It really takes us as an industry coming together and, and making our voices heard. Um, and these cowboy hats and the boot, boots echoing in the hallways, it really does a lot. In fact, I always call it cowboy voodoo because it really gets in the psyche of these uh, members of Congress when, they, when, when these folks come to D.C. Well, we were able to tag along with you on a couple of your congressional visits today, and uh, they really do take ownership, meaning your members that are with you on trips like this, on having that opportunity to talk about their industry and what matters to them. Yeah, myself, like most execs, I sit in the background. I do not engage. I talk to these folks on a daily basis, and this is the opportunity for these cattle producers, these folks that walk in the ballot box and make the decision of who to vote for, to tell these elected leaders where they stand and what's important to them and their families, and to keep that family going. I mean, when you look at our delegation, we have a lot of young people, and when you look at this industry and the average age of a farmer is almost 60 years old, less than 5% are under 35 years old. If we want to sustain this industry, we want to talk about sustainability, we've got to empower the next generation, and we have them here meeting face-to-face -face with their members of Congress. Yeah, we even noticed a few junior members uh, a part of the delegation this year. How encouraging is that to see some young members of Missouri's beef cattle industry walking the halls and talking the talk here in Washington, D.C.? It's a big deal. I mean, these folks are really the future. This is why we do what we do. Um, so much of what we do um, with national cattlemen's or at the state level is long term. Sometimes you don't see short term benefits. But every single thing that we do, every regulation, every piece of legislation about sustaining the future of this industry, and that's for these young people to pursue uh, their dreams and to come back to that family farm if they want to. As we mentioned, we're doing this program part of the 2018 NCBA Spring Legislative Conference, uh, but you guys do something similar back home in Missouri uh, during the legislature in your own state capital where you bring cattlemen and cattlewomen together to meet with state legislators and their staff. Yeah, we do it different than any other state that I'm aware of and certainly different than any other agricultural organization in our state. So we don't have one event where we have our members come to the Capitol. We don't have a legislative conference. Every single Wednesday, and we implemented this about five years ago, we have Cowboys at the Capitol. So every week, every single week of legislative session, we have our members at the Capitol. And we divide that. We have seven regions in our state. We have the regional vice president in charge of that. So on any given week, you'll see the Cowboy hats at the Capitol on Wednesday, anywhere from 10 to 50 cattlemen at the Capitol every single week. And what that's been able to do for us uh, legislatively, uh, where that's taken our association has truly been phenomenal. Mike, we appreciate you joining us on Cattlemen to Cattlemen and keep up the good work and keep that passion alive for America's beef cattle industry. Appreciate you, Russell. Thank you. All right, again, we've been visiting with Mike Deering, the Executive Vice President for the Missouri Cattlemen's Association. Thanks, Russell. Now, another great reason to become an NCBA member is the chance to read the National Cattlemen. It's the official publication of NCBA and provides timely news and information such as market and weather reports. 
A subscription is included free of charge when you become a member of NCBA. Just call 1-866-233-3872 or you can visit the website ncba.org. Still to come on Cattlemen to Cattlemen, we head to Texas for expert insights on effective ways to battle mesquite. Stay with us. We'll be right back. When you're in the cattle business, no matter how much it's a business, it still starts with cattle. It's this basic notion that sits at the core of how we approach things at Beringer Engelheim. We understand when you put the cattle first, it just naturally leads to doing the right things. If you want to do well in this business, you start by doing right. Take care of the cattle, and they'll take care of you. One of the keys to success for cow-calf producers is providing adequate grass and forage for their cattle. But that job gets especially tough when weeds and invasive species such as mesquite are in the picture. Cattleman to Cattleman reporter Candace Weida has insight on ways to win the battle against mesquite. For cattle operations here and in much of the Southwest, one of the biggest barriers to improved grazing and wildlife habitat is mesquite. We came to Texas to gain some insights from industry experts and producers who are experienced in battling mesquite. Mesquite uh, robs moisture that uh, we can sure use on our, on our rangelands. Mesquite is a very prolific plant down in the southwest. Um, Texas, it, it, it really is a big problem for us, probably our biggest noxious plant problem. Mesquite is a uh, real concern to us because it's an invasive species, it's very prolific. Canopy cover causes us problems. It, it uh, shades out our natural grasses, and thus reducing our forage growth, less grazing ability. The problem is, is that it comes in and basically makes a monoculture. Shades out a lot of our native grasses. Um, not only causes a monoculture from a brush standpoint, but also from a, a forage diversity standpoint. Only certain types of plants can actually grow under a mesquite canopy. And so you can actually change a pasture quite dramatically just in the diversity of the forage plants with a mesquite uh, canopy coverage. Why is mesquite so difficult to control? Mesquite is very hard to control, mainly because it's such a prolific re-sprouter from the crown of that plant, the base of that plant. We can actually go in and top kill mesquite by cutting it off, mowing it, shredding it, um, fire or anything else, and not kill that plant. Uh, it will re-sprout from the base, so that the, the target, when we're talking about killing mesquite, is actually killing what's below ground and not what's above ground. With mesquite, we, it was, uh, management program was developed over, out of necessity. We were losing so many, so many acreage to mesquite. Uh, our hand was forced, uh, we had to come up with something. Uh, Sendero was our best avenue. Tell us about your experience with Sendero here on the operation. Our experience with Sendero uh, has been very good. Uh, we've, we've been very happy with the results we've, we've received uh, using Sendero on our mesquite. We've been able to reduce our, our uh, mesquite population, our canopy cover significantly. Sendero in conjunction with other management tools have really helped us. We, you know, incorporate that diversity and increase the diversity across the ranch. We started a mesquite research project back in about 2007 and over about a seven year period we came up with Sendero herbicide and our goal with that project was to not only improve the mortality of, of mesquite control that we get from, from a herbicide but also the consistency of that. What are some of the different ways that Sendero can be applied? Sendero can be applied in, in a multitude of ways. Um, mainly, we, we put it out with an airplane as an aerial application uh, in a low volume type situation. We'll do what we call individual plant treatment, uh, backpack type sprayers or uh, UTV or ATV type sprayers where we spray individual plants. Uh, we can spray the foliage uh, with Sendero and, and, and do a very good job with a little wider window of application. Why is timing so critical in the application of Sendero? 
with mesquite control probably the number one thing that we really need to look at is proper timing um, and there's several factors that we want to look at um, we want to look at the time of year that we actually start spraying uh, and essentially what we want to see is is we kind of start counting back after bud break and we want uh, full leaf development and we want dark green leaves once we get those dark green leaves then that we know that at that point it's a fully developed leaf and we're actually moving carbohydrates down into that root system. We talked about wanting to kill that root system. So we have to, we have, to have the carbohydrates moving down in that plant and going to the root system. So the timing to do that is very critical. What are the advantages of having selectivity in mesquite management? Through the research project for Sendero, uh, one of the things that we began to notice is, is how selective it was to mesquite and we started noticing how it was leaving some of the more desirable species unharmed, such as our oaks, such as our bromelias, such as our lope bushes and things like that that are important wildlife species. The selectivity of, of, of Sendero herbicide is really an important part of it today, mainly because of the fact that landowners are beginning to utilize their land more from a wildlife standpoint. Uh, compared to, to cattle. Now there's still obviously lots of cattle producers out there, but, but a lot of those cattle producers also have a benefit from their wildlife populations in terms of economic income and things like that. Using Sendero, the selectivity of it actually gives us the benefit of leaving some of our desirable species. Those desirable species are important for wildlife habitat. Being able to decrease the mesquite and increase the diversity of, of the desirable browse and forbs has uh, given us the ability to increase the, uh, the quality and quantity of our deer herd. Uh, our bobwhite quail population has been gaining ground, uh, whereas most place, other places there's an opposite trend from that. The unchecked invasion of mesquite can cut forage production by 60 to 70 percent. Dr. Jim Ansley with Texas A&M has been researching new ways to win the battle against mesquite. People have traditionally done brush sculpting with mechanical treatments where you take a bulldozer out there and or some other big piece of heavy equipment and clear lanes uh, either uprooting plants or knocking them over and that obviously is very exact. You can do that exactly where you want to but the problem with that is typically unless you're pulling the plant out by the root system you typically get the re-sprouting that occurs and so all of that investment maybe sometimes three hundred four hundred dollars an acre all of that investment goes by the wayside uh, in five ten years because of the re-sprouting and you have to and then you're looking at a at a re-sprouting forest of mesquite that's even worse than you had it before. Sendero can do that for a much cheaper cost and the other nice thing about it is that you've root killed most of those mesquite in there and so they're not going to re-sprout and so the the longevity of keeping that area open is much much longer you know 30 40 years. How does Sendero bring value to cattle producers who are looking to control mesquite for grazing purposes as well as for wildlife? So it is, it's really more of a, of a, of a difference in, in what you want to do in, in different spaces on that landscape. Uh, Sendero is, is uh, uh, as a product, it, 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 it's very good about not drifting. And so it, you can be very exacting as to where you want to uh, spray Sendero. So if you want to have a 30 acre area of, of open land that is currently infested by mesquite, but you would like to convert that more to an open grassland, uh, or maybe a grassland that has some of the better shrubs in it for forage value, uh, Sendero can be used for that. But you may want an area right next to that that you still want to keep as, as a dense patch of mesquite or some other brush species for wildlife habitat. So, the nice thing about a product like Sendero is that it allows you to do that. You can do that brush sculpting in a very exact manner. So if a producer is looking to restore their pasture for the purpose of grazing as well as wildlife, where should they start? The first place to start would be to really try to get a good inventory of how that brush is distributed on, on that area. You usually have quite a bit of variation in that brush density. 
And what I would recommend is that typically in the areas that have the most dense mesquite, that's where you're going to have the least grass production and probably the most, the most deterioration of your grass community. In my opinion, that's not the best place to start. I would work on, I mean, if, you, if resources are limited and you realize that you can't spray the entire pasture, you don't have the resources to spray the entire pasture, and you may want to have a little bit of wildlife habitat in addition if that's one of your goals, I would work on the areas that are maybe a little bit less dense, that still have a pretty good grass community, that you can get a, be a better bang for your buck uh, when you spray that immediately because that grass community will respond faster. There's no doubt left untreated, mesquite will take over a pasture and leave little or no grazing for cattle or habitat for wildlife. That's why new tools in the effort to manage and control mesquite are so eagerly welcomed by producers. In Texas, I'm Candace Wieda reporting for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. For more information on mesquite control and Sendero herbicide, visit the website controlmesquite.com. Still ahead on Cattlemen to Cattlemen, we'll look at the long and interesting history of raising beef cattle in the Aloha State, Hawaii. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Say goodbye to your toughest pasture and rangeland weeds for good. Because one product offers season-long control, handles the widest spectrum of broadleaf weeds, and clears the way for increased forage with greater grazing flexibility. So you get more beef per acre at a cost that can't be beat. It's Grazon Next HL Herbicide. And if it's in your pastures, plain and simple, weeds won't be. Don't miss your chance to read The National Cattleman. It's the official publication of NCBA, and it's packed with timely news and information about the issues and events that affect your cattle business. Plus, The National Cattleman includes producer education, cattle market insights, and more. A subscription is free when you become a member of NCBA. Join now by calling 866-233-3872 or on the web at ncba.org. Here on NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen, from time to time we put the spotlight on great or unique things that are happening within state cattle organizations across the country. Today, we turn our attention to Hawaii and the work of the Hawaii Cattlemen's Council. Joining me now is Dr. Lisa Wood, a veterinarian and president of the Hawaii Cattlemen's, and Dale Sandlin, the managing director of the organization. Welcome both of you to our show. I guess to begin with, Dale, uh, you both took on a pretty big project in putting on a uh, putting together a five-part video series, teaching people about the beef industry in Hawaii. Why did you guys do that? Sure, we we wanted to show the care and commitment that our producers have, and and the daily pride that they put into their product every single uh, chance they get. So, what we were able to do is work with the Hawaii Department of Agriculture to develop a contract that would help us promote beef and do that not only through this five part series but also uh, gave us uh, the ability to create two new websites, one for the Hawaii Cattlemen's Council and the Hawaii Beef Industry Council and then also to help us revitalize our Hawaii Beef Ambassador Program uh, so that they could be able to tell their story in their own way and uh, really make that a priority. You know, Hawaii is a fascinating place but uh, not some place that most people think of when they think of the beef industry. Lisa, what, what were some of the things you were trying to communicate to people relative to the Hawaiian beef cattle industry through this video? I think one of the things we really wanted to be sure that we honored was the great history of the beef industry in Hawaii. In our first video series that talks about our legacy, the, the people in that film do a wonderful job of explaining how cattle came to Hawaii and how the, the ranching industry grew out of that. One of the most important things that happened in Hawaii occurred in about 1850, and that was the Great Mahele. It was a land division act that allowed, for the first time, private land ownership. And at that point, um, we moved from small 
subsistence farming to larger agrarian operations like sugarcane and pine. And with those um, large businesses came the need for labor. So many of our waves of immigration began at that time and they came first from the Asian countries, from China and Japan. We have immigrants from Korea. We also have European immigrants, people from Portugal, Germany. And as these people started to come in and join our workforce, many of them came to work on the plantations. But our cattle industry was also slowly starting to develop and the people of Hawaii were very, very welcoming. And there was this very um, unique sharing of cultural differences so that in the saddle house, they would speak Hawaiian, but you would also hear the sounds of the ukulele and the guitar. And in the tack room, there could be equipment um, that had either Spanish or German origin. So there was this wonderful blending of all these cultures that allowed the birth of a, a new culture that we call now Paniolo. That is absolutely fascinating. You know, it's so important for all of us to tell the real story of beef production. Since this is a five-part video series in Hawaii, we're going to share one segment at a time with our Cattlemen to Cattlemen viewers. And we'll ask the two of you uh, to share insights with us each time we do. So let's begin our trip to Hawaii cattle country with a look at the history of raising cattle in the islands. From Mauka to Makai, Hawaii is filled with amazing sights. What is sometimes overlooked is the long, rich tradition of raising cattle in Hawaii. In fact, Hawaii's ranches produce a significant number of high-quality cattle and beef production is an important economic contributor in the state. Likewise, the men and women who raise cattle and produce beef today play an important role in protecting Hawaii's natural resources where cattle have been raised for centuries. Those men and women are also ensuring the rich history of the industry is preserved so that it may be passed on to future generations. Hawaii's cowboys, known as Paniolo, are at the center of this effort to preserve the past and to pass along the lessons learned from a lifetime on the land. In those days, the Paniolo, my tutu man used to say, you know, you raise, you breed your own cattle, you breed your own horse, you breed your own cowboys. So Paniolo to us is more than just a culture, it's a lifetime. My great grandpa, they worked on the ranch. I was raised on the ranch and my grandfather, my dad, but they worked for Puawa Ranch, neighbor from Puck Ranch right across from here. And they've been cowboys all their life and then I guess I just followed the tradition. It's tough to put into words sometimes what the Paniolo culture means. Um, but if you've been around it and you've and you've experienced it, and you've particularly seen older generations before you demonstrate what it means. There's a work ethic involved with it, which is um, unequaled. They'll get up any hour of the day, any kind of weather. They'll go out and get the job done. They'll do it with good humor. They'll take a beating sometimes, physically. They'll be resourceful. You can throw a cowboy in a tough situation, he's gonna figure out a solution. Without a lot of fancy tools and technology, he'll figure it out. Uh, there, there is that spirit to it. And, and they can be dead tired and aching and soaking wet, and they got a smile on their face, and they're still joking on their way home. The Paniolo culture is, uh, is, is, is fascinating. Captain George Vancouver brought the first cows here in 1793 and uh, the vaqueros were brought in in 1832 to teach the Hawaiians how to, how to raise cattle. So the Paniolo tradition goes all the way back to uh, 1832. And it's a unique blend of, uh, of, of uh, you know, love and interest for cattle and land with the Hawaiian culture. And there is no history of Hawaii without uh, the Paniolo history. Cattle have played an important role in the history of Hawaii as one of the longest enduring agricultural industries in Hawaii. The first uh, introduction was in uh, 1793, and he made a second uh, uh, tr trip back with 
cattle. This second one included a bull, at least one bull. I think Kamehameha is pretty astute, you know. He saw the value of this animal as being a real source of protein. In order to control and protect the cattle, large stone fences and corrals were constructed to create pastures. Today, some of these walls still exist on the islands, demonstrating the sheer size and scale of the early days of cattle raising in the islands. Despite changes in markets and production methods, the paniolo remains an important part of the process, and today's cattlemen and women take pride in passing along the paniolo ways of the past to future generations. And I know that now and forever, we have a, a, a job to do, and that is to be identified in this Hawaiian community. If you study the history, Paniolo made the history. So to me, that's something to get excited about. That's something that I'd like my kids to learn about. Up next, it's time for a visit with our good friend, Baxter Black. So stay with us. We'll be right back. Join the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. NCBA is the oldest cattle industry organization, working every day to defend your interests in Washington, D.C. And there are big benefits to being a member. You'll get news you can use in the National Cattlemen and policy updates from Beltway Beef. Plus big discounts from John Deere, Cabela's, and more great partners. Join now. Call 866-233-3872 or sign up online at ncba.org. Did you know that Prefert makes over a thousand different farm, ranch, and rodeo items? And now, thanks to Prefert Direct, it's easier than ever before to get access to every item Prefert makes delivered direct to your local dealer. For more information about Prefert Direct, visit us at prefert.com. Prefert, America's number one name in farm, ranch, and rodeo. When a new calf hits the ground, his clock starts ticking. A belly full of colostrum gives him his best odds, but if he doesn't get any, his time starts running out. That's when you grab a bag of Oxford egg colostrum in their patented feeding system. Fill them with warm water, shake it to mix, feed it with a tube or nipple, and you are done. No bucket, no bottle, no mess, and right on time. Get yours at OxfordEgg.com. Costs less than a dead calf. Did you ever stop and think to yourself, this will be the last time? Well, today will be the last time I'll kiss my little girl. Tomorrow she steps into womanhood, confident, confused, comely, cultish, curious, charming, garrulous, fierce, and fearing. Who will take care of her? And who will she love? And what will she remember? And what will she forget? What star will guide her? And will she forgive herself when she can't always live up to her own expectations? Will she choose the right path when the easy path beckons? Will she discover the difference between pride and vanity, between courage and posing, between distance and privacy? Will she experience the joy of the golden rule, the heartbreak of losing, the satisfaction of an anonymous kindness, and the love of a child? Will the boulders in her life make her strong or break her spirit? And how will she handle random acts of fate, accidents, and blessings? Will she need to assign blame? Will she make messes or clean them up? Will she find passion in her life of the mind and the heart, a burning, a yearning, a calling, a cause, a reason to get up every day? And will she know peace of mind, contentment, and the solace of her own company? Will life be good to her? And will she always know that no matter what happens, I will always love her, and that she will carry the burden of my love even when we are separated by miles and years and harsh words and the vacuum of minutia even beyond life itself? So many questions. So I sit here thinking all these thoughts, knowing this will be the last time. 
She will be a woman in the blink of an eye. And as I kiss her cheek, I can only ask, where did she go? This little girl of mine. This is Baxter Black from out there. Thanks, Baxter. I can certainly relate to that one. That perfectly captures the excitement and sadness every parent feels when our children grow up and leave home. We'll be right back with more right after this. Stay with us. Well, I think a rancher has to be a steward of the land. There's nobody else that can take care of land better than a rancher. When we switched over to the Perina products, it was a step in the right direction. The difference we see in the cattle is the consistency of their nutrition. The cattle hold their condition a lot better throughout the whole year. It does make a difference that we can see, day in and day out. Welcome back. As a viewer of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen, we want to hear from you. If you have questions or comments or even a story idea for us, drop us an email and we may use them on a future show. Send us your thoughts at our email address, that's c2c at beef.org. We want to congratulate Kendall Frazier, CEO of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. Recently, the National Agri Marketing Association has named him the inaugural Ag Association Leader of the Year. Frazier was honored during the Agri Marketing Conference in Kansas City, Missouri. This award recognizes individuals who have made significant contributions to the agriculture industry. Kendall started with NCBA back in 1985 and has served in a number of roles and worked on a number of high profile projects during his three decades with the association. We thank Kendall for his service to our industry and congratulate him on this well-deserved honor. Well, that wraps up this edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Thanks so much for spending time with us. We'll see you again next week right here on RFD TV.